transition. All right, you're going to you're going to Second Corinthians, Second Corinthians, and I'm going to meet you there uh, in just a moment. It's going to be in Second Corinthians, chapter number seven. Uh, but I, I'm going to read here just as, just by way of kind of reintroduction uh, to the the thoughts for today from Joel chapter number two, and specifically in verse twelve. Uh, Joel 2 and 12 is where I'm reading. You're in 2 Corinthians 7. Therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your heart, and, uh, and rend your heart, and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. Lord, we pray that you will help us as we think about some uh, characteristics, some attitudes uh, with which we can demonstrate a heart fully committed to you. I uh, thank you, Lord, uh, for uh, kind of the seed thought for these messages coming from um, the uh, events of September 11, the heroes. Uh, Lord, that were involved there, those that are still working so hard to this day, uh, 22 years later, uh, to help people who suffered so terribly from that time and, and still suffering, really. Uh, I pray that you'll bless those families that are still struggling. I pray that you would help our nation to remember in a way that helps us to turn to you and uh, that, of course, were, uh, where is where, from where the thoughts for this uh, these messages today uh, have come. And so I pray that you'll help me, Lord. Please cleanse me of sin. Help me to be filled with the Spirit, Lord, and to preach your word carefully and correctly. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. And so we were talking about the, the correlation uh, between Joel, at least certain phrases and verses here in Joel, uh, and uh, that uh, relates to and our attitude and what we saw and the response that we saw uh, from others uh, 22 years ago uh, when the uh, Twin Towers were uh, taken down by a terrorist, uh, air, uh, you know, controlling the aircraft, and uh, Flight 93, the Pentagon, and all that went on there. Uh, a lot of the activities, a lot of the attitudes, a lot of the sorrow, a lot of the shock uh, is indicated also here in the book of Joel, uh, and it's connected to actually the... Uh, judgment of God, uh, and, uh, and, and so uh, I mentioned to you this morning that that thought, uh, when it was brought up uh, in those days after 9-11, was not received well in America, and I, you know, as a whole, and uh, I think uh, that's because sometimes we might say we want truth, but we really don't want it. We want somebody just to kind of smooth things over for us. Uh, we want somebody to make us comfortable. When in reality, if God allows this kind of thing into our life, the last thing we should be is comfortable. We should be very uncomfortable with the chastising hand of God and be ready to respond to that in a way that pleases Him and helps us to become uh, more like uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so uh, we were talking about this, uh, this, these two phrases here, or this phrase here as it relates to rending uh, your heart and not your garments. And what we needed to see uh, after 9-11 uh, was a heart rending in America. And I think a lot of times what we got, just like with COVID and other things, uh, what, we've got, what we got uh, was a shallow, somewhat political show, and then everything just back to status quo, back to normal. Uh, and so America has not responded uh, like I believe God would want us to have responded. Uh, after 9-11, nor do I believe America has responded as God would want us to after COVID. Do you realize tonight our churches should be full? And uh, we had a little sprinkle, you know, coming down through here. And, you know, when, it's, when it rains around here, uh, it's like all of these people have been transported to Vermont and they're trying to deal with snow. Have you, have you noticed that? The driving just gets erratic. Uh, and it might be safer if we had ice on the roads. <laughs> um, uh, you know, the way that people uh, act uh, in uh, this, uh, this kind of thing. And, uh, and, uh, but they don't, uh, you know, we, sometimes we don't respond well to adverse things in our life. And I think um, that's what happened with the nation of Israel. 
uh, you know, and uh, they didn't respond well. Neither has America. That's why I said a minute ago. Uh, the traffic was so jammed up. I told Pastor Harold on the way down, I said, I sure do wish all these people were headed to church, don't you? I could almost, I could almost deal with it if I knew they were headed, and right down to Maranatha Baptist Church, right off 17. I mean, I could probably deal with it a little better, but you and I both know that's not where they were going. That's not at all. On, some of them were now. I don't want to cut off everybody, but at the same time, um, you know, most of them were probably not even thinking about church on a Sunday afternoon, and so America has not responded in the way that she should, and uh, not through 9-11, not through COVID. And I, so I, you know, I asked the question this morning as we closed the service, uh, what's next? What, um, what has to happen uh, in order for us to wake up? We, you, we saw that even in verse 5 of Joel 1, awake, all right? He said, rend your hearts, not your gums. What does that look like? Well, we connected that word heart with David, who was known as a man after God's own heart. And so if you want to see what someone's life looks like uh, when their heart is given to God, you see it in David. And we looked at two characteristics this morning as it relates to him and tried to tie it into the attitudes that we should have seen uh, and should have uh, really expressed ourselves uh, as a result of these uh, tragedies and especially 9-11. Uh, we should have seen a submissive heart, a submissive heart to God. A realization that, that we are not our, that, you know, we're not the captains of our own destiny, that, that God is sovereign and that we are answerable to him and we should have been submissive to God. Then we said that uh, that submissiveness would have come from a heart of humility. David exercised a subjection to Saul's authority that went far beyond Saul to God. It was a love for God. It was an appreciation for God. It was a recognition for God that led him to have uh, the, the attitude of submission that he had toward uh, Saul, whether Saul at the time was uh, being an appropriate uh, authority, uh, and then when he was not being an appropriate authority, David still respected him uh, and sought to do the right thing there with the right attitude. Remember we said this morning that David said, you know, you're the king of Israel. What are you doing chasing a dead dog such as me? And so that connects this idea of submission with the second attitude, a heart's attitude that we should see, and that's humility. Humility. And David was the one that said, who am I? What is my people? Who am I that I should be son-in-law to the king, David said. Who am I uh, that, that, uh, that, um, that uh, me and uh, my people should be able to offer so willingly after this sword? First Chronicles 29, I believe, is where that is. Uh, and so David had an attitude of humility. Uh, and uh, if we have a heart that is rent, that's what we should see, uh, a submissive heart, uh, a subdued or a humble heart. And then I want to pick up here tonight in the time that we have and say that we should demonstrate a sorry heart, a sorry heart. I don't mean sorry by way of quality, and that's why I want to meet you over here in 2 Corinthians chapter number 7 so you have an idea uh, why we use this particular word, uh, that there should be a sorry heart. 2 uh, Corinthians 7, uh, and uh, down in verse number 8, Paul is following up, of course. 2 Corinthians is a follow-up to 1 Corinthians. That's deep theology right there. Uh, but he's following up what was a very corrective letter in 1 Corinthians, very pointed, um, uh, uh, and uh, warned them, I'm coming to see you, and if you don't have this stuff together, we're going to have, you know, there's going to have to be some follow-up here on this. And so... The good thing is that apparently the Corinthians responded as they should have. Whatever Paul intended for them, they received. And in reality, his letter brought them to repentance. That's a good picture of what the Word of God should do for all of us when we're confronted with our sin, bring us to repentance. And so that's what it did for them. And so Paul is discussing his previous communication with them here in 2 Corinthians chapter number 7. Uh, and beginning uh, here uh, in verse 8, he said, For though I made you sorry with a letter, there's that word sorry, I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent, though I did repent. Now, what's he talking about there? Uh, the torn state of the heart when, uh, when, he, uh, when he needed to confront them. And he, he, he did not intend uh, that uh, his words would destroy them. He wanted his words to correct them, to help them. And so uh, he said, though I did repent, for I perceive 
that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. Now, there's a key phrase right there when we talk about having a sorry heart. We shouldn't live, in a sense, in sorrow because of disobedience all the time. But there needs to be a time of sorrow in order to produce repentance in our life. And so he says in verse 9, Now I rejoice, not that ye were made sorry. I wonder how many of you have tried to instruct your children and uh, correct them, or grandchildren, or even great-grandchildren, and whatever you said to them just broke their heart. And, um, you know, I have had this happen even back here. I won't call a name. She'll catch her name, and then it'll be over after that. But uh, I, 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 at one particular time, not long ago, I got a little bit direct. Uh, and a boy, oh, man, the chin started quivering, and the, and, and, and she, and the response was basically, hey, <laughs> did, did Pop just talk to me like that? Was Pop getting serious with me? <laughs> I joke with her all the time. And she, she didn't know how to receive it. Her, her, her little heart was broke, in a sense, you know. But I will say this. The correction took place and didn't have to lay a hand <laughs> uh, there uh, because her heart. And that's what's going on here. You don't like to see that. You don't like to see somebody's heart broken. But it's necessary for correction. And so I rejoice not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed, here it is, to repentance. Now, repentance is a change of mind that leads to a change of action. There needs to be enough sorrow in our broken heart to lead us to say, I don't want to live like this anymore. I don't want to be like this anymore. I'm going to change and turn to God. I'm going to turn to him. I'm going to follow him. I'm going to obey him. See, repentance, change. Some people are sorry all the time and never change. Well, that's just being sorry, right? Right? A genuine sorrow should lead to repentance. Godly sorrow should lead to repentance. And he says that here. For you were made sorry after a godly manner, verse 9, that you might receive damage, there it is, by us in nothing. In other words, it wouldn't come out to damage. Here's the point. If, if we're heartbroken about something and we don't come to repentance over it, to linger in that will bring damage, damage emotionally. Um, uh, damage in our, in our spirit, in our heart, if we don't correct ourselves before God and come to the point of repentance. Verse 10, for godly sorrow worketh repentance. There it is. To salvation not to be repented of. In other words, the end result will be something that you won't hear. It's talking about salvation. But at the end result of godly repentance, uh, godly sorrow that produces repentance will be something that you won't have to repent over. See, Because it produces something that's good. Now, uh, verse 10, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Now, get that. And we see that in our society, don't we? People have no hope, no joy, nothing to live for. And, uh, and so their sorrow is just really, it's just a downward spiral. But in God, we have, a, uh, we have the sorrow that leads to a better way. The world doesn't know that. And so it just leads to death. And so he says, verse 11, For behold, this selfsame thing that you saw it after a godly sort. Look, watch, here it is. What carefulness it wrought in you. Yea, what clearing of yourselves. What indignation, not, not anger at Paul, uh, not anger at God, but uh, indignation with their sin. That's what he's referring to there. And uh, yea, what fear. That's reverence. Yea, what vehement desire. That is to be right with God. Yea, what zeal. Yea, what revenge. And uh, to regain the ground you lost. In all things, you have approved yourselves, look at this now, to be clear in this matter. What a wonderful phrase that is. Uh, how often are our hearts and minds clear? See, they'll never be really clear until we are genuinely sorrowful that produces repentance. Now, how does that relate to David? Well, you know David had the sin with Bathsheba. And uh, it was a choice he made. He made a lot of mistakes in that thing. Uh, and uh, uh, he, um, uh, he, you know, he ended up facing the judgment for that. Uh, and, and, and God, of course, took the life of the child and all of that other kind of thing. Um, David made some mistakes as it related to that sin. He initially, 
instead of being sorrowful and repenting, he initially tried to cover it up. And when he tried to cover it up, he made things worse. There's a lot of people like that. Uh, a heart that is truly rent before God will be a heart that, as I quoted, I think, last Sunday morning, uh, wants the sin of their life revealed and taken care of and cleansed by the Lord. They don't want to live in it. They don't want to follow it. They want it to be made right. They want to be clear in whatever matter uh, in which God is dealing with them. They want the peace of having that clear conscience, that clear heart, that clear mind. And instead of looking for that, David tried to cover up his sin. He pulled Uriah out of the battle, you'll remember. Uh, and then when Uriah didn't do uh, what uh, David wanted him to do, then, uh, then David made things worse uh, in that uh, he tried to get Uriah drunk. And what he was trying to do was uh, get Uriah to go down and be with his wife. Uh, so the conception there of the child would be covered up. He was trying to cover the whole thing up. And as we've said before, uh, David no doubt was challenged by the fact that, that uh, even in a drunken state, Uriah had more character than David did. Because Uriah said, I'm not going to go down there and do this. How can I, uh, how can I be comfortable at home uh, and to be with my wife at home when the armies of Israel are on the battlefield? And, um, you know, that's one of the problems that, uh, one of the things that caused David to fall into sin was he was not where he should have been. And he was lingering around. He didn't have enough to do. And, you know, somebody said the idle mind is the devil's playhouse. And the next thing you know, there he is. And so whenever we're somewhere we're not supposed to be or not somewhere we are supposed to be, we're, gonna, we're fixing to find trouble. Uh, and... Um, uh, and so not only, though, did he, uh, did he uh, disengage from the battle, but he ignored the warnings, and there were several of them, the first of which uh, uh, was uh, from the other folks there that said, wait a minute here, is this not Uriah's wife? Hey, what are you fixing to do here? And I'm going to tell you, if there's anything that's not received in our day, it's a statement like that. Wait a minute. Consider your ways. When I hold on, who are you? Well, hey, maybe I love you in the Lord. Maybe I don't want to see you make uh, bad choices. Maybe I don't want, want you to fall into sin. Maybe I don't want your life uh, damaged. That's who I am. And, uh, but um, David warned him, and uh, I mean, uh, they warned him, wait, what are you doing here? That was the Lord's first warning. And he ignored that and went on and, uh, and took her. Uh, and uh, the end result was, of course, now you think about this, where was the Spirit of God in all of this? And I'm telling you, we've talked about before the importance of being having a sensitivity to the leadership of the Spirit of God in our life. You remember when David was anointed king, the Bible says the Spirit came upon him from that day forward. It wasn't as if the Spirit was gone from him, but he ignored, no doubt, those warnings. The warnings of the Spirit. You and I do the same thing. We, we uh, disregard the warning of others. We, dis we disregard the warnings of the Holy Spirit. We disregard the warnings of the Word of God. Wherewithal shall a man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And we ignore all of that. And then we end up falling in sin. And then what we do after that determines where our heart is. David tried, as I said, to cover it up. He pulled Uriah out of the battle. He encouraged Uriah to sin. And then when, it, when the Uriah wouldn't do it, listen, he ordered Uriah to be killed. And he sent, uh, he sent Uriah's execution letter uh, by Uriah back to the battle to the hand of Joab. And so he found himself in a, a, ending up worse than when he, when he started. Now having committed adultery and caused a brother to be idle and to stumble and now committed murder, just digging deeper and deeper and deeper. That's not a heart committed to God. It's a heart committed to self-preservation. And that's what David did. The Bible says in Proverbs 28, 13, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. But whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. 
I like the way that last phrase is in there. If it were to stop, he that covereth his sin shall not prosper. Well, then there'd be some that would take that to mean we've got to go around telling everybody what's wrong with us. <laughs> but he says that we need to confess and forsake. There it is again. Confession, repentance, turning back to the Lord. Uh, and uh, that's what the God wants for us. Matter of fact, we were talking in, uh, we've been talking for a number of months now, and, uh, or maybe I've been doing all the talking, in my Sunday school class about the inspiration of God's Word and how we know that it's inspired. And one of the ways we know that is because of the honesty of the Bible. The bad things God says about his friends. Huh? I mean, Noah, we, I mean, we went through the whole list. Noah got drunk, had a problem there with him and his family. Uh, David uh, and the sin with Bathsheba. Adam uh, and uh, all of these. Uh, remember, Christ is referred to as the second Adam. So we have all of these heroes of the faith in the Bible. Uh, many, if not most of them, mentioned in Hebrews chapter number 11. And in every case, God says the truth about them. Man wouldn't do that. Man doesn't do that. Matter of fact, a lot of these uh, books that are false religion, they whitewash all the badness of the individual that's supposed to be the hero, you know? Not God. That's one of the indicators that the Bible's God's word. Man wouldn't write that if he could. And so, uh, but, but David here, you know, uh, uh, all of this uh, that David did, uh, he, uh, uh, he, he, God used him as an illustration for us. And I mentioned this morning in Sunday school, you know, the Bible says that things that are written aforetime time are written for our learning. Man, I'm glad I'm not on the Lord's lesson plan. Listen to what I'm telling you. Can you imagine? I I'm glad for the discretion of our God. I'm glad that the Lord keeps our sin between us and him, except for that which public and involves others. I'm glad. I'm, gl <laughs> I'm glad David's name's in the Bible and not mine. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, David, uh, God used this example of David and uh, what happened in his life uh, to, uh, to give, us a, give us an example that we need to move to repentance quickly. And Nathan came to him and told the story, you know, um, uh, uh, about the, the uh, visitor coming and the lamb and one little lamb and he was talking there about Bathsheba and here Uriah had one wife and you took her. I mean, that's a whole thing going on. And, and David's mad. And he says, this guy's got, we got to do something about this guy. And, and then uh, get him, get him. And then Nathan said, you're the man. You're the man. You're the one. Now, I don't know. I, you, I, look, uh, only the most carnal and maybe those might, who might be religious and unsaved can sit through as many services as some of you all have over the years and not have at some point had the Holy Ghost of God said, you're the man. You know how that feels? Boy, I'm telling you. And cold chills. And uh, here you were, you thought everything was doing all right, and next thing you know, pretty regular, somebody will come up to me after service and say, who told you about me? I said, nobody, and I don't want to know now. <laughs> Whatever it is, just talk to God about that thing. Amen. Amen. That's the Spirit of God. And he wants to bring us to a point of brokenness. And David wrestled with that thing some estimate that david's attempt to cover up the sin lasted about a year or so what a miserable year for david and you read about the misery of it uh in psalm 38 and psalm 51 where david talks about how his bones were broken and and all that and he's uh he's crying and uh, the burden is always there and his sin's gone over his head and he's and he's miserable because he's not come clean with God. But at some point he did, Nathan said, Thou art a man. And David said, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan came back and said that with that wonderful phrase, And the Lord has put away your sin. Wow. You shall not surely die. That didn't mean the consequences didn't come, and they did. But the Lord has put away your sin. He admitted his sin, David did. I've sinned against, that's what a heart committed to God does. It says, right, Lord, I've sinned, just like the prodigal. Come to yourself in the, in the, uh, in the pigsty and you say, uh, hey, uh, what am I doing here? What, how did I, you know, my goodness, my, you know, my, my father's got more than heart could wish, and here I am, you know, eating pig slop. 
I'm going home. Thank God for every believer that comes to that point in their life when the conviction of the Holy Spirit's on them. I'm going home to my father. Now, you can hear in the, the tone of voice. Remember, you, you remember how the prodigal left, don't you? He was irritated. And he said, look, I want you to give me my inheritance right now. I want all of it. It's mine, and I want it before you die. Can you imagine having that conversation? I mean, he was just a, he was a, he was a little bit cross-grained. That's a new word I learned recently. You know people that are cross-grained. You know anybody that are cross-grained? <laughs> uh, and uh, he was a little bit cross-grained with his father. But don't you notice, after he had wasted his living, uh, wasted, wasted his substance with riotous living, the Bible says, now he says, I'm going to my father. You notice the tone change there. You can, you can sense it. His whole tone changed towards his father. He began to realize how ungrateful he'd been. He, he, he began to realize how, and forgotten how good he had it when he was there with his father and with his family. His whole heart turned. His heart, listen, here's the point of it all, turned toward his father. And he wanted to go home. It didn't matter what it cost him. He said, I'm going to go home and I'm going to tell my father I've sinned against heaven. Uh, I've sinned against God. I am no more worthy to be called your son, he said. Make me as one of your hired servants. Hey, just to be back at home with you, just make me a servant. Wow. That's a heart toward the Father. That's a heart of brokenness. And, of course, the Father received him there uh, and, uh, and restored that whole relationship. Wonderful picture of how God, uh, uh, fellowship rather, uh, uh, relationship was never broken. Uh, but the fellowship and a wonderful picture about how uh, of our relationship with God and our fellowship with God and how God is willing to restore that and very willing and uh, the greatest proof of it is not first John 1 9 it's the cross of Calvary that's how willing God is to forgive our sin uh, because Christ paid for it on the cross 1 John 1, 9 is just the principle that comes out of the cross of Calvary because of Jesus' shed blood. <laughs> and so uh, David finally confessed his sin and God put away his sin. He accepted the consequences uh, of that. He accepted the chastisement. He did the same thing when he got proud and numbered the nation of Israel and God brought judgment and began to kill people. And, uh, and David saw the, the angel of the Lord destroying these people and he, he said, it's enough, it's enough. He said, this was my decision these people had nothing to do with this. my decision you know part of a heart for god is somebody that accepts responsibility for their own action accepts responsibility for uh, their 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 part in any given thing somebody with a heart for god is not going to be somebody that throws others under the bus they're going to be somebody, where did we get that phrase? <laughs> I use it all for comfortably, I'm not exactly sure. It wasn't from Maranatha Baptist Church bus ministry, I'll tell you that. But, um, <laughs> uh, you know, the, the, the thing is here, you know, it's not somebody that's going to blame shift. Look, Adam in the garden, he didn't have a heart for God. He had a heart for himself. He was in self-preservation mode to the point where he said, God, it's a woman you gave me. You know, and... She blamed the serpent and all of that. David owned his responsibility. That's a heart for God. That's a man who has rent his heart and not just his garments. And then he, he demonstrated that when God allowed the child to die and David saw his servants talking, he saw them whispering, and he knew the child had died. And so he just went and asked them. They were afraid to tell him. And so he, because he had gone through all, he didn't, hadn't eaten and, and, uh, and all that and gone through all the mourning and the prayer and the fasting and whatever, and they were afraid to tell him. It is to no avail. Uh, the, the child has died. Well, he went and asked him, is the child dead? And they told him plainly the child was dead. And then the Bible says uh, that, um, uh, that then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his apparel and came into the house of the Lord and worshiped. 
That's a heart for God. That heart realizes that God and his judgment and his, is always just, even when we don't understand it. And you, you won't respond to God that way unless you've wrenched your heart and not just your garments. You won't respond to God that way. You get angry, you get upset, you blame God. You know, why me? <laughs> why do we use that phrase anyway? It's like we forget all of suffering human history when we say, why me? I think the right question is, why not me? You know. And so David, David, uh, David confessed the thing, and he showed great sorrow, as we said, for his sin. Psalm 38 and 6, he said, I'm troubled. I'm bowed down greatly. I referred to this earlier. I go mourning all the day long. Here's the thing. God, you might be wanting to let go of it or cover it up or to hide it. God is not going to let go of it because it's a disruption in your fellowship with him. And God loves you enough to send his son to die on the cross of Calvary, and you have received his son as your personal Savior, and the Lord's not just willing to let that thing go. He said, I in sorrow continually. In Psalm 38 and 17, he said, for I am ready to halt. I'm just ready to die. That's how bad this is. This conviction and my sorrow is continually before me. And this is far more than just shallow level confession. It was David having a, uh, having a sorrowful heart over sin. That is not what we saw, except for maybe initially, and it, it appears even then to have been on a surface level in our, in our country after 9-11. We, we didn't see that depth of sorrow. Oh, there were a few here and there, of course, but not to the level that would have honored God in the greatest way had our nation turned to God in a meaningful fashion. And so... Uh, if, if we're going to demonstrate this heart, uh, if we're going to say our heart is given to God, if it's rent, it's completely committed to him, then there's going to be demonstrated a, a submissive heart, a subdued heart. There's going to be a sorry heart. And then finally, there's going to be a seeking heart. A heart that just cries out for God all the time. That just wants to, wants to know him better, walk with him closer. Uh, so, uh, uh, Psalm 25 and verse 15, David wrote, Mine eyes are ever toward the Lord. That's a committed heart. Mine eyes are ever toward... There's a great deal in just in that phrase. My eyes are ever toward the Lord in seeking him, to know him, as I said a minute ago. My eyes are ever toward the Lord in dependency upon him. I know from whence my blessing and help come. They come from God. And so my eyes are ever toward him it is a seeking heart psalm 18 and verse 1 i will love thee O lord my strength the lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer my god my strength in whom i will trust my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower <laughs> when i first uh, and this is true no matter where you are uh, in that stage of seeking him or God's dealing with sin and trying to bring you back to him. <laughs> I remember, I think I may have told part of the, uh, used this illustration before, when we first got to Tennessee, when we came back from Japan, I got a, uh, I've, I've talked about the steel plant that I was in before we came here. But prior to that, I got on with Nissan. And uh, I was in the muffler department. And um, welding mufflers. Now I wasn't welding them. This robot was welding them, and it wasn't it wasn't a very good welder. Uh, <laughs> and uh, they told me when I got that the, you know it was one of those places where because you're welding all the time, you've got all that whatever they call it that comes off of that slag or something like that. It's just a dark part of the plant, you know. I remember walking into the plant. <laughs> And the whole ceiling was black. And I don't know if that's from the welders. I don't know if they painted it black. I don't know what. But that was a depressing place. And I felt like I was in a cave. And not just in a cave, right in the middle of it. Right in the smack middle of it. Where the slippery, nasty, mossy part is in the cave. That's where I was. And they, <laughs> they told me when I first took my place on the line that I was going to have to man two machines. 
Uh, and so the one robot, you put the welder parts, you put the muffler parts in there in a certain way. It's got to be set just right, guide and all. Put it in there, hit the button, and it starts to weld, and you put another one in and hit the button, you know. Uh, and uh, uh, I was trying uh, to, uh, to, to be efficient. Efficiency is the word of production. You know what I'm saying? Efficiency. So uh, uh, I was trying to coordinate, the, and I learned after a while. You know how some of y'all know it. Some of y'all know it to work with tools. You can hear a cycle it's in, and you know what's about to happen. That's how I'd gotten to where I was trying to time that thing. Well, what they didn't tell me was they said, you are in the worst part of this line. You have the oldest equipment on the whole line. You can work to your most efficient level, and you will never keep up with what's coming in front of you. And so before long, I'm buried up to my eyeballs in mufflers. And I cannot keep up. And then I'd pull a muffler out, and that uh, robot didn't finish the job. So I'd have to turn around and set it on a table there, and they made the mistake of giving me a welder. And I put that thing on there and hit the button and just burned a bigger hole in it. It was terrible. And, uh, and had these big leather gloves, you know. And when those mufflers would come out, the rings where it would weld around that muffler from the, from the um, whatever that part is to the whatever it was, that ring, it'd be glowing red when it come out of there. And every once in a while, I'd grab the red ring. I was in a hurry. And I'm telling you, it didn't matter what kind of thick glove you had on, that burnt. And you could smell it. You know, and that's where I live. And I remember <laughs> trying to hustle and do what I was supposed to do. And all of a sudden, I, had, I came to myself and I said, God, I deserve this. I did. And it was uh, a terrible place to be. It was a terrible place to work. The thing about it was when they find out that you're willing to work and work hard, they keep you right there. Now, this, I heard them talking one time. They didn't know I heard them. And I was supposed to move out to another department, and the, the manager of that line said, not that guy. Apparently, I was a glutton for punishment. He enjoyed it. So he's like, we're keeping him. And I thought to myself, no, <laughs> no, I don't want to stay here. But right there in that dark place with all of that burnt stink around me, it occurred to me, God's good. And I didn't know what the next steps were. I had no idea, Maranatha, at, this, at that point, that I would be here one day. I had no idea. I changed jobs to that steel factory. I started at the bottom there. And uh, um, grinding burr off of steel to prepare it for welding, bending and then welding. Man, what a terrible job that was. And the same thought. I deserve this. I deserve this. Um, and that turning of the heart to the Lord. And then God begins to show you the future. The realization in the midst of the, of the difficulty of it that God is good, that God is forgiven. Just like he said here in Joel uh, chapter number 13 there, uh, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness. That's what I found out. Right in the middle of a dusty old, dirty old muffler plant. God's good. God's faithful. God's just. And the heart calls out to him. Calling out to the Lord continually. Mine eyes are ever toward uh, the Lord. And so David found that out. Paul knew it. Philippians 3, 8. Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. And so David cried out to him. Listen at Psalm 42. As the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God. For the living God, when shall I come and appear before God? Psalm 84 and 2, my soul longeth, yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh crieth out for the living God. That's a heart completely given to him. That's a heart that's rent, not just garments. That's a heart that's focused on God. That's the kind of heart we should have seen in America after 9-11. It's the kind of heart we should have seen in a greater way after this COVID thing. And so it's frightening to think what's next, as I said, because of a failure to have these 
demonstrated characteristics in the life of our country and even to some degree in our churches. He said, thy loving kindness is better than life. Wow. That's a heart for God. And so we ought to seek him after that fashion. Again, I'll just read to you from 1 Samuel 16, 7. The Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. So again, Joel 2. Thus saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart, with fasting and with weeping and with mourning, and rend your heart and not your garments, and turn you unto the Lord your God. Let's stand together and bow our heads for prayer. A submissive heart, a subdued or a humble heart, a sorry heart, and then a seeking heart. This is, these are the characteristics of the individual who has a heart for God. Do you have that? Lord, I pray that you'd help us with these truths tonight to realize by the help of the Spirit through the truth of your word where we stand before you as it relates to these matters. And I pray your Holy Spirit would convict us where we have failed. Lord, may we turn to you and not away. May we turn and surrender to you in all things for your glory and for our help in Jesus' name.